This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmuth. Good morning, I'm Justin Warmuth. In 2016, Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy became the first Vietnamese American woman elected to Congress, ousting 12-term Republican John Micah. Since then, she has watched her national profile grow, especially after being selected to serve on the House Committee investigating the January 6th riot at the Capitol. But after three terms, Murphy decided to retire this year to focus more on her most important role, being a mom. I had a chance to sit down with her this week to reflect on her time in Congress. I think a lot of people are wondering if what comes next for you? You have this high profile, you've, you have done so much in Congress. Is, is, are you taking that one step at a time? Where does that stand? Well, for sure the next chapter will include more time with my family mm -hmm. and a bit of, of a more sane pace of life. Um, but I believe in public service. I always have. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I will find ways to serve my community and my country. Let's, let's take me back now to 2016. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a massive underdog, you, who burst onto the scene and take down a 12-term congressman in a historically red district. What was that like for you? And what do you think resonated with voters? Well, if you might remember, June of 2016, we had the Pulse nightclub shooting where a gunman walked into a nightclub and took the lives of 49 innocent individuals. And I thought to myself, you can't have people at the highest levels of government spewing this kind of hatred and not see it manifest itself in your own community. If you wanted to change Washington, you had to change the kinds of people you were sending there. Mm -hmm. And so I launched a long shot um, campaign. and. I ran on gun safety and LGBTQ equality and opportunity for this community. Um, and, you know, national Democrats told me I shouldn't run on those issues in Florida. They told me I needed to run an anti Trump campaign, and I refused to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out I was right. Um, people care about the issues that affect their community and their lives. And I am so grateful that Central Florida gave me an opportunity to serve them. When you, when you talk about why you decided to run, and, and obviously Pulse having such a, a determining factor in that, as you reflect on the last uh, six so years, do you feel like enough was done in your time in Congress? Um, when it comes to gun safety, are, are you proud of what was established? I know that there uh, likely you would like to see more done, but that's how politics works. There's you know, some give and take here. So yeah. as you look back on the last six years, are you proud of what was accomplished since what happened at Pulse? Well, I am proud of the steps that we have taken to improve gun safety in this country, namely the um, lifting of the 22-year ban on gun violence research, which I led and passed into law with a completely Republican Washington, a, pres a president that was Republican mm -hmm. in a Republican Congress. And then um, in this term, we just passed additional historic gun safety um, legislation. But the fact that we just witnessed Colorado experience what our community mm -hmm. experienced um, in 2016 with a uh, gun violence incident at an LGBTQ club tells you that there's still so much more that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that folks who are in Washington in this next term see that we not only were able to pass gun safety in a completely Republican um, government, but also in a divided government, mm -hmm. and that they don't give up hope that they can keep moving forward with um, change. What would be your ideal gun legislation in this country? Well, I think we need to make sure that we pass legislation that balances uh, the Second Amendment rights um, with keeping our communities safer and basically ensuring that we keep the most dangerous weapons out of the hands of the most dangerous individuals. You know, I, I just I'm curious, you know, from the outside looking in, I think that uh, folks just have this idea of what Washington is. But as being for, for being on the inside, mm -hmm. what is that like as a moderate centrist Democrat mm -hmm. in this polarizing, divided Washington. Is it as polarizing as it appears from this vantage point, being on the inside? And what is that like? Does that take, does that take a toll emotionally? Or what? just take me through that, uh, what it's been like. You know, it, um, 
it's not as polarizing as it looks from the outside. We're not always fighting. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, some of my closest relationships have been made across the aisle because we've worked on tough issues together, um, whether they're foreign policy issues or domestic um, policy issues. And it takes having respect for one another to have conversations where you disagree, mm -hmm. but have those conversations so that you can find the common ground and move that common ground forward. Um, I think some of the more divisive conversations have actually been in the family conversations, right. um, conversations with Democrats who mm. had um, wanted purity over progress. And those are always a little bit more difficult um, to have those mm -hmm. family conversations. But, you know, we as legislators, those of us who are in Washington who consider ourselves legislators, um, know how to treat one another civilly and try to advance the interests of this country and our mm -hmm. communities. Do you feel like culture has taken uh, more of, of a priority uh, for some lawmakers as opposed to policy? Yes, I certainly think that yeah. there are more activists um, mm. than there are legislators mm -hmm. um, than in the past. Mm. Um, and my hope is that everybody who goes to Washington chooses to be a legislator. We don't need more talking heads. We don't need mm. more um, protests. If you get the honor to sit in one of those seats and make laws for this country, you have an obligation to be somebody focused on policy and on legislation. I, I think... Um you would agree, because this was the thought, uh, that I, I believe that Democrats did better than so many people thought they would in the midterms. Um, not the case in Florida, though, as you saw those results come down. Uh, first off, take me through what you make of the results nationwide uh, across the country when it comes to Democrats doing better than expected, and then the overwhelmingly red wave that Florida experienced in the midterms. Well, I think it's still true that candidates matter, and that's true whether it's Republican or, or Democrats. Mm -hmm. And Democrats were able to hold on because in a lot of what we call frontline seats, seats that are easily flippable by the Republicans, um, we had incredible candidates who not only campaigned on um, issues that mattered to the uh, their constituents, mm -hmm. they have been serving in that way for the last two years. They have been providing solutions, passing bills that help their constituents, and their constituents acknowledged that and rewarded them for that. Um, and I think in Florida, you know, it's a lesson to the Democratic Party not to take the wrong lessons away from not getting blown out in a midterm. Mm -hmm. um, kitchen table issues still matter. Um, getting things done in a pragmatic way still matters. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, you have to look at New York and Florida and say, you know, this wasn't, um, this isn't something anybody should be taking a victory lap over. I, I've never seen, I was expecting uh, the governor to do well in his reelection bid. He did do well, but I think by this margin of victory, nearing 20 points, something that we haven't seen in a long time, um, and a historically bad loss for Democrats, is. are you under the impression that Florida is now a red state, or is this something that ebbs and flows with time? I think this is something that ebbs and flows with time and with effort. Mm. And so the Democratic Party really did not put together any sort of ground or field game. Mm -hmm. And so in Florida, um, the last time we had a Senate race, we, our candidate lost by 10,000 points. Mm -hmm. I outperformed him by 8,000 in my district alone, but that's because we had a robust field game. Mm -hmm. and. Democrats in Florida, you have to go out there and ask them for their ballot and ask them for their vote. Mm -hmm. You can't do it just on the media, um, on the TV. Right. And so the winners of this election cycle were the media consultants and the TV stations mm -hmm. who they tried, you know, our party tried to run an airwaves only campaign mm -hmm. and um, we saw how that doesn't work. Coming up, Congresswoman Murphy will talk about the Capitol riot and her role in the House Committee investigating what happened on January 6th. Stay with us. This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Welcome back. Our guest this morning is Democratic U.S. Representative Stephanie Murphy, who decided to retire this year after serving three terms in Congress. We'll talk about her role in the House Committee investigating the January 6th riot at the Capitol. But first, more of her reaction to the results of this year's midterm election. Well, I think the, another takeaway from this election is that it was a repudiation of personality politics, mm -hmm. right? People want we are looking at potential recession. We're looking at economic hardship and people are struggling. So they don't want 
personality. They want policy and pragmatic approaches to governing. Mm -hmm. And I think the former president tends to play a little bit more in the personality space, especially um, mm -hmm. now that he's not in office anymore. And you saw that reflected in the outcome of uh, a lot of races across the country. Also living in the past while claiming that the election was uh, stolen, uh, the 2020 presidential election was stolen. As um, I do want to ask you about uh, your time on um, the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th riot. Um, tell me about that and um, what you've made of those hearings and whether that's had an impact uh, on the general public. Well, so it was really an honor for me to serve on the January 6th Select Committee because I wasn't born in a country that had democracy. Mm. And so I know how fragile it is, and I feel like it, this was an opportunity for me to stand up and defend our democracy in this country by laying out the facts of what happened in the run-up to January 6th and on January 6th so that we can prevent this from ever happening again. As an American, nobody should want a Democrat or Republican or an independent to unilaterally decide the outcome of a free and fair election. Mm -hmm. And so that's really been the objective of this committee. Um, we have gathered a lot of information. We'll be putting out a report here shortly. Um, but I do think it gives me a little hope seeing the election results that the American people rejected election deniers. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that democracy still matters mm -hmm. uh, to voters. I, I'm curious how much of your day to day was dedicated to this because it was a lot. Um, I, I just know by watching it that it is, there is so much to delve into. Um, was that a challenge uh, to also balance, you know, constituent work and things like that and the day to day yeah. that comes with Congress on top of how much goes into investigating something like this? It took a lot of time. And you have to remember, I also serve on the Armed Services right. Committee and Russia invaded Ukraine. Oh, um, my goodness. And then I'm on the Ways and Means Committee, and we were the central committee working on the project to lower the cost of prescription drugs, mm. as well as providing the tax incentives to help businesses and workers during the pandemic. So I had a very <laughs> full plate over the last two years. And um, but the select committee work was important, um, yeah. and you know, in addition to serving my community, as I always have through constituent casework. Mm -hmm. I, you know, obviously there have been a number of people charged uh, with sedition and um, in that also, you know, stormed the Capitol that day. But do you feel that the former president uh, should be charged or face charges for his role in what happened? I think that's a decision that the Department of Justice um, mm -hmm. should make. Um, I am a legislator, yeah. and so I kind of focus on my lane, which mm -hmm. is to gather the information and provide recommendations on what we can do to strengthen our democratic systems, our election systems, and that's what we've done with the Electoral Count Act and some other proposals that are out there. Um, but I'll leave it up to the prosecutors to determine whether or not they have a case, um, a criminal case or a legal case that they can bring forward. Do you have any trauma from that day? I mean, you know, I think to myself, I was in the heart of the Capitol, in the basement of uh, the Capitol, thinking that was the safest place to be, only to find myself feet away from the um, mob that was on that West Front Terrace that you've seen so much footage mm -hmm. of. And um, at some point, I found myself fleeing. Um, and it does um, sit with me that um, some 40 years prior to that, my family and I fled persecution as well mm -hmm. from communist Vietnam. And that's why it makes me more committed to um, reinforcing our democracy. Um, it takes every citizen to do their part, whatever your political affiliation is, um, to reinforce our democracy. I, I'm just, I, I, there are a number of House Republicans who, it, on the surface, it, it just doesn't seem like they care to get to the facts of this and get to the crux of how this was able to happen. Um, but they were in there that day, mm -hmm. and they dealt with the same thing that everyone else dealt with as these mobs, this mob stormed the Capitol. Is, is that surprising to you to that, that they may care more, at least on the surface, that it, about Hunter Biden's laptop or other things of that nature rather than getting to the bottom of this? Well, I think all people tr process trauma differently, and mm -hmm. then politicians also have um, 
their constituency that they need to serve. Sure. And I think, um, you know, in the immediate days, you had real honest conversations about how people felt. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of saw that slide into whitewashing. And it's not exclusive, right? You can pursue um, other issues of interest and investigate those things, but also still stand for democracy. You can also um, push forward legislation that addresses inflation and helps people at their kitchen table and also um, reinforce our democracy. Mm -hmm. It's not mutually exclusive. Right, right. I, I, I'm curious because we are running out of time. Um, I, what are you most proud of, of your time in Congress? I'm proud of um, not only the way that I conducted myself, working with um, both sides of the aisle to advance pragmatic legislation that made historic investments into infrastructure and um, the environment, as well as lowering prescription drug costs for our seniors and moving forward gun safety, but doing so in a pragmatic policy focus, kind of apolitical way. Mm -hmm. um, that's you know, not only what we achieved as an office, but how we achieved it is what I'm most proud of. Do you feel like that old school approach um, is is something that's lacking today? Um, what, what if, what, hypothetically, do you think this country would be better if we were more aligned in that respect, where it's just everyone's around the same middle ground instead of the wings of the airplane, if you will? Do you think this country would be, would, would be a better place to live? I think that the American people do occupy that middle sure. area, yeah. but through gerrymandering and other things, our electoral outcomes reflect the extremes. Mm -hmm. And I haven't really known any of the folks who live in the extremes, either on the left or the right, mm -hmm. for advancing any policy that has become law and made a difference in someone's life. So um, in order to serve the vast majority of Americans, I think as a legislator, you kind of have to occupy that center aisle. Mm -hmm. What will you miss most? I'm gonna miss um, the policy work and the people. Mm -hmm. um, I made some real lasting relationships um, in Washington and um, with people who believed in getting things done and, and advancing this country. And we were able to work on some pretty amazing um, legislation together. And so I'm gonna miss those things. So when you look back on 2016, when you were elected, on that election night, when you saw those results, and then you reflect now, uh, some six years later, you'd be proud of yourself? Yeah, I absolutely am. And I'm proud of um, our Congress in this country because we are a citizen Congress, right? Mm -hmm. It's about average people getting an opportunity to represent their community. And I think to the Central Florida community, I just have to say a heartfelt thank you. Thank you for allowing me to serve you. Um, it's been the honor of my life. Now, as for who takes over to represent Florida's 7th Congressional District, Republican Corey Mills defeated his Democratic opponent by 17 points in the midterms. Important to note, that district expanded into the GOP-leaning Volusia County after redistricting. My thanks to Congresswoman Murphy for her time this week, and we wish her the best as she moves on from public office. I'm Justin Mormuth. Hope you have a great Sunday.